Hello? 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 Hey! This isn't a bar. Or, or is it? I don't know. What's in the coffee, Nate? It's a, it's a mini bar. The drinks are really expensive, but you pay when you check out. That was horrible. We can, we can break the ice better than that, I think. <laughs> so my name is Brad Hozak. Um, this is Nate. I'm the director of DevOps at VidCo. Uh, some of you may have heard of it, some of you haven't. Uh, we're kind of recent here on the scene in the Twin Cities, and uh, we're actively hiring. We can talk about that later. We're talking about design-driven development. Last night at 2 AM, you probably saw in the program that we actually had called it design-first development. And Nate's like, I like design-driven development better because it's like 3Ds. And I said, I think Guy Fieri already has like a lock on that on Food Network. But so I was like, well, what about 3XD? And then I'm like, oh, that's probably a JavaScript framework somewhere already. But <laughs> 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 we're going to go with it anyway. Uh, so we're just kind of make that up. So anyway, I'm Brad, and this is. Hi, I'm Nate Edwards. I'm uh, the director of mobile at VidQ. That's us. So um, this is uh, so design-driven uh, development is something that's really close to us. We're from the University of Minnesota. Uh, we've researched and and taught and um, gone to many conferences and and spoken about design, uh, specifically looking at like user experience. Um, and so when we go into the classrooms and and we're teaching our students, um, these are things that we're not just telling them, right? Um, we're getting that feedback. And oftentimes it's, well, that's not the right way to do it. And uh, we go, OK, cool, awesome. And we go back and we, we redefine what we sort of have learned. And we find new ways and new approaches of, um, of providing what we need to provide to our students, or um, in other case, users or customers as we see it. And part of our, our role at the University of Minnesota um, is in addition to the development wor work that we were doing, we would also teach classes. Uh, a gentleman in the back here, Charles Miller, um, is kind of one of the, the guys that started uh, what was called the LT Media Lab a few years back at the university. Um, and it was a way to actually bring a technical component to working on grants that were coming in through the, the program that we were a part of. Uh, and he had this awesome opportunity to be a part of this project called Earth Education. And Earth Education was this idea of researching community and looking at the intersection of education and sustainability in remote areas on different continents around the world. As a part of that, he had to travel, and he still had courses going on. That was an interesting problem because unlike traveling to Texas or Florida or any, any place nearby, there was a, a problem with time zones and, and just uh, geographical issues as far as connection, water, <laughs> things like that. Um, and so while he was away, he wanted to still connect with his students. Um, as a part of that, excuse me, Nate and I would also step in and teach classes, but he wanted to still hear, because he, he's always been very passionate about the design courses that he's taught, uh, he always wanted to hear how the students were progressing and what better way than to hear it from the students. And so that was kind of the problem we were starting to look into. Uh, and what comes along with that is how do you figure out how to spark, engage, and, and capture those experiences, right? For us to just report back, or in any role, if you're part of a sales team and it's an international one and you're wanting to report back to a, either a peer or a team or something like that, how do you actually capture that experience other than just, oh, the meeting went well, we talked about this, right? So, so we wanted to find a way to do that better. And one of the ways we, we would do that in education is through this ridiculous thing called a forum. I don't know if anyone's ever seen those before. This is a tech conference, so probably not. Uh, <laughs> and, and in courses, the one thing that we would do is ask questions like, I don't know, what's Vygotsky's impact on higher education in today's classroom? And inevitably, you'd get a response from someone that was like, well, Vygotsky's uh, biocultural understanding of the way that we work within society can really be mirrored by um, how we see subcultures in the online environment. Yeah, yeah. That was pretty good off the top of your head. 
Uh, and, you know, as educators, we would do something ridiculous like say, okay, after you've given a response, you're going to have to then also respond on at least three or four of your classmates. And so my response to him would be, oh, I agree. <laughs> or LOL, that was a good one, you know, or a great answer. And one of the things that, that we realized in, in this kind of broken affordance is, is what I'll refer to it as, uh, is that you have this situation. So I'll, I'll stop it there. But you get the idea. In forums, it's really easy to right-click, right? It's really easy to look up words. It's really easy to make yourself sound smarter than you are. And we wanted a way to make the educational experience more authentic, right? Everyone has a personality, so why wouldn't we want to hear it? And that's when we started thinking about a different way for students to collaborate with, with educators um, and start to break down some of the, the questions we were, we were addressing earlier with sparking and, and capturing that experience. Something was funny in the next room. That's awesome. <laughs> so that's when we started working on an idea called Flipgrid. And we're going to use that as kind of a case study moving forward. So we'll talk a little bit like, I've, I, like we have been with the, the University of Minnesota connection. Uh, but we're actually going to take you through how we've approached design and, and use it as a challenge to drive the, the development that we do. So um, everyone knows what Agile is, right? It, uh, it's one of those buzzwords that we hear all the time, and people use it to their advantage to sort of extend timelines, and scope creep comes in, and we all put it within this great bucket called Agile. Um, some people love it, some people hate it. Um, we cherry pick some of the Agile. We look at the Agile Manifesto, we cherry pick some of it. They probably hate that we're doing that. Um, but we, uh, we found what works for us, and, and we've paired it with um, some of these, uh, some UX principles, and we found some great um, cross-pollination that happens between the two. Um, if you go through the Agile Manifesto, and then you look at some of the more seminal works of like uh, looking at UX design, um, you'll see that oftentimes there are very, very close similarities between the two. So who's, who's familiar with this background image? Who's seen it? Oh, man. It looks... It looks like um, like a snippet from a J.C. Penney's catalog from like <laughs> the early '90s, um, but actually it's the the background to um, the Agile Manifesto. So the purpose here isn't to take you through the Agile Manifesto, right? We've all we've all been there and done that, but we want to sort of look at how we use it and how we've utilized it, and also look at where it's broken, right? And sort of see like how we've how we've uh, gone about fixing it. And, and to say that we have all the answers to how this works um, is against the rules of uh, Agile, the Agile Manifesto. So no one get over me, you know, no one get on me on that. Um, so frequency and change, right? Sprints. We all deal with sprints. How long, how long do you guys, who has, who, who's in a sprint right now? <laughs> how long are your sprints? Two weeks, yep. That's the way it should be. Oh, four weeks? Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> one week. I like that. Um, so, you know, so what do sprints afford us? Especially those short ones, right? We have short stories. Um, we're not going out and, and saying, okay, this sprint's going to be three months out, and you need to build everything, right? Because what ends up happening? What's that? Crunch. Crunch. And then you get to the end of it and you go, you have one of those oh shit moments, right? Where you go, oh shit, I did not build that the way it should have been built. Um, so what, what else does it allow? It allows for this reflection, right? We have this, we have this period where we're in sprint. And then we can actually go and talk to each other and reflect on what went wrong and what worked, right? 
and we're not we're not we're not down the road a month sorry um, we're not down the road two months um, we're we're right in it so we can then quickly uh, change based on that frequency I had one more oh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry <laughs> um, and then you know we can fine-tune adjust and become more effective <laughs> <laughs> so collaboration right this is to me <laughs> is super important. This is what I've found to be the most important, is having that balanced team. When we're working on projects, we don't want to have engineers in one room, product managers in another room, and then have the design team completely disconnected from everyone else, right? Because what happens then? Something will trickle down. It will probably hit design. Design will come up with something that looks cool. Um, and I'm not trying to minimize designers, I'm one of them. And then it gets handed off, and then we go through this vicious cycle of, oh, that's not the spec, or we need to add this. Um, and so what you're not doing is you're not creating that trust that's required, right? So if we're all leaning on each other, and we're all working together, we can make rapid changes, but we also are trusting each other. And that goes cross-team, and that's it's super important to us. Um, and then also, almost just as important, is um, embracing the suck, right? We all fail, and if we fail together, and we do it cross-discipline, that's extremely important. And who came up with embrace the suck? Oh, <laughs> look at this guy, he's sneaky. Um, right, Jeff Atwood, coding whore, co-founder of Stack Overflow. Um, so this is important, right? If we, if we fear everything, um, and we don't embrace us breaking things, we don't embrace ourselves breaking it together, uh, then we're in real trouble. So then we look at responsiveness. Um, we need to respond to change, and we need to follow, instead of following just this strict plan, and that goes back to having these short sprints, being able to communicate with each other. How many people have stand-ups here? Right in the morning? No? When do you do them? So we, we like to do stand-ups in the morning, and I guess <laughs> our morning compared to other people's mornings might be different. Our morning's 9.30. Um, but through that, you know, we able, we're able to quickly communicate with other people, and we're on this, we're, we're able to be responsive in, in what's going wrong. You have a blocker, am I your blocker? Um, and then we can fix those issues. So then we look at communication, right? Who uses Slack or HipChat or any of that stuff? Awesome tools, right? Love them. Um, <laughs> I think I put, yeah. So you can put in cool things like emojis. You can send someone an animated GIF of a cat. Um, if Brad's down, I'll send him a picture of an animated cap, cat and hopefully lift his spirits. <laughs> so, so this actually happened to us um, early in this week, right? We're talking about toggles, super exciting stuff. Um, and so was this, this is just a complete disconnect over Slack, right? What's the toggle? I thought this should be here. What's the functionality? And so this is the break where we were going back and forth. And this said, if, if I could scroll here, it would, we could go up to just a bunch of back and forth on what's going on. So then I was in a different room, and I decided to actually go and talk to the people that are building these things, right? So we have, I'm with Chris. I think toggling will be confusing. 14 minutes later, I'm building toggling, right? And that's not me going in and saying, we need to have toggles. The idea is that we had a conversation. And we had a conversation with the designers, iOS developers, Android developers, and then we were able to come up with the plan, right? And this plan is then shared. It's trusted with everyone, and if it breaks, we all suck together. So then we can, then, then we can celebrate, right? We can do our, uh, our animated cat gif our creepy animated cat gif. <laughs> so if, if that were my cat, I'd, I'd be like, wow, that cat is awesome, and then I'd leave my house immediately. <laughs> so now we're looking at user experience, and so now we're looking at sort of the philosophies behind user experience and how those tie to the method methodologies of Agile. Um, James Garrett, 
Does anyone know who James Garrett is? He's an awesome UX designer. Um, he sort of came up with these planes. And then also Mark Bolton, not to be confused with Michael Bolton. Anyone know who Mark Bolton is? Web designer, super big into like responsive design. He was one of the first pioneers. Right? But he, he said, you know, design isn't visual. It's not just visual. And, and oftentimes we see this as just being visual. We've had a lot of interviews where we have awesome engineers come in and they say, but I'm not a designer, right? Because it's, it's not just picking color combinations or making something look pretty, right? If you're a great engineer, you're a great designer. I can guarantee you of that. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at the strategy, right? So we're, we're moving from this abstract layer of strategy and we're going to go and look at sort of more of these concrete, how this actually gets implemented, right? So strategy is how we're building this out. What are the needs of the users? What are the goals of the product, right? And then once we come up with those, we're, we're no longer a product. At least that's how we see it. You become an environment, right? And then those goals are no longer just goals. They become core values. So then what we can do is, as we're progressing through and we're using this agile approach, we're not we're not worried about scope, uh, scope creep because we go back to what are the core values of this environment. So if you were to say, hey, you need to build a combo box here and it needs to be, be this funky color or whatever it is, then we go, well, is that fulfilling the core values of the environment? And if not, we scrap it. And if so, it gets implemented. Scope. So we have these uh, functional specifications, right? And we all, we all sit here and we talk about scope and everyone sort of says, oh, scope. Um, so what are, the, what are the actual strategic goals? How can we actually lay this out? And where are we going to find, where can we aut automatically and early on find where we're going to have issues, right? That is sort of laying out that, s that scope. And how do we align that? with the teams. So everyone becomes an investor early on. We're not going from project, from customer to product manager to designer, then finally kicking it down to design, uh, engineers, and then a couple months pass by and who knows what ended up happening. Please. So here's this awesome, I mean, we just had a holiday, right? We, I, I went to Easter brunch and, you know, you're sitting there and you're eating and then your dad says, hi, son, how's the family? And I know that means something's coming. Like, so, and I know we all have that. I, I, come, I had, a, like, an IT background before and I would always fix people's computers on Christmas Eve. Like, thanks. Um, <laughs> but, but now oftentimes I get, like, just random SMSs, like, I need a website. <laughs> and if, if your first response isn't why, you're doing it wrong. It should always be why. And if they can't tell you why, what have they, what have they failed? There's no strategy, right? There is none. So then if they say, if you say, what's for the requirements of the site? <laughs> I typed that wrong. Um, and they say everything, well, then what they, don't they have? Scope. Scope is out the door. So what ends up happening? <laughs> Add all the things. Put everything in there. I got an email from my dad last week. He said, can you build me a website? And I was just like, oh my god. I said, just, okay, send me something. And he shot me an email um, with an attachment that was seven pages long. <laughs> and what do you do with that? I mean, are you just supposed to copy and paste it in, right? What, like, so there's no strategy, there's no scope, um, and there's really no product. And then we look at, right, no structure. So, it, so what we're going now is, is, is starting to take that more abstract, looking at strategies and scope, and then how can we actually apply that to what we're building? How can we determine what the user flow is, right? Like, how often do we actually look at user flow? This needs to inform everything that we're creating. This is how people are going to be looking and using our sites. And then we also need to see how we can 
evaluate that? How can we look at dev considerations and make sure that's tied into the goals and the core values of our application? <laughs> so, thanks, buddy. So then we look at building out these skeletons, right? This is where we go back to the core values. We need to ensure that what we're building is what the user wants and needs and that they're able to then get what they need out of our environment. So we can have all these great ideas, but if we're not actually visually forming these out initially, early on, then there's no way for us to then go back, evaluate scope, strategy, and so on. So this is what everyone sees as visual design, right? We have this surface. It looks pretty. Um, Really, the takeaway here is that you know we've we've got so many awesome design. Everyone, you know, we all go to Dribble. We all see these awesome designs, and we go, "I want that," right? But what is that? Have we actually reinforced what we're looking for, like what we've created in our previous planes? Like, is that what the user wants and needs? Are we creating something that's super distracting? Um, who's who's who started as like a Flash developer? Anyone or was a Flash developer? Right? How many like websites did you go to that were just like, it was just Flash? Like, it was a website just to do Flash because of Flash. Uh, um, <laughs> and and so that's when we need to actually really reevaluate. Like, are we actually visually constructing something that the user needs and wants, and are we getting them to where they need to be? And so we're looking at who knows what crap is, not who knows what design crap is. Right? We're looking at contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity, sort of looking at those visual pillars that we look at in design and development, or in design, I should say. And those become really important. And we go back to that, and then we also look at core values, and, and we see, are we, are we aligning what we need? And so this always gets me, the, the hamburger stack, right? If we have a hamburger stack, I have this love-hate relationship with hamburger stacks. I'm sure everyone does. But if we have a hamburger stack, what's wrong? What's wrong? Our nav is hidden. We probably haven't architected our information, right? So, so we also need to have these considerations when we're visually designing something. Like, if we're getting to a point where someone just says, throw it in a hamburger stack, like the dribble stuff, like, you know, someone builds a sleek YouTube channel, but then they have this hamburger stack in the corner that's just sort of there. And you're like, I wonder what's behind there. A bunch of stuff. Um, <laughs> that's where this becomes in, comes into play. And we need to completely consider all of these planes when we're building our environments. You can hit right now. Uh, <laughs> so the description of the need, the, uh, the interesting thing he brought up is I definitely am... Uh, from the, the AS2 variety back in the day, a little flash de development. Go to and play, that's, that was my go to. Anyway, um, so obviously, when we're talking about the, the need, the need is definitely a three minute long animated trailer for the website, don't you think? I mean, I think, I think everyone needs that. And forget the skip button, right? But no, and, and so in seriousness, um, when, when you think about what we were talking about earlier, about Charlie traveling, and you start thinking about what Nate was just talking about, um, and, and how can you apply that to solve a problem, um, we started thinking, okay, so we need to be able to connect students with their instructor, and we need the instructor to, to reciprocate and, and connect with the, the students, right? Um, and so, giving the, the logistics of traveling, asynchronous was a fantastic concept, right? So as a need, that, that was the, the first check item on the list. Because um, that affords a, a few things, right? Ease of access on, on your schedule. If it's real time, if it's Skype, everyone has to be there. Um, that's sexy at times, but, but this is solving a, d a different problem. Uh, the time zone barriers, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but it's allowing for that creativity of someone. If, if I have you on the schedule, we're talking at 10 o'clock FaceTime. Let's do it. You can prepare and you can think about it and, and, and you can come to that meeting. But there's, there's a missed opportunity there. Um, and, and what we're looking for, when I said earlier that we wanted to capture an experience, 
I also said that we don't want it to be anything other than authentic. However, being able to re-record yourself and, and capture just what you're wanting to get across, it's still you. And there's the, a fine line right there where we identified a need for, for us because we wanted to know who you are, we want to know your best self, but we also want you to be able to reflect on what you're trying to communicate, right? Being able to say something, watch it back, and think to yourself, you know what, that's not exactly what I was going for, or my cat danced on my keyboard, or, you know, whatever the case could be. So, so that was big for us. But another thing that um, we didn't want is, as we were thinking through this, we, we knew that other educators would, would want to use this tool as well. And, and we started thinking it should go into a K-12 market. And one of the biggest issues that we've always seen is bullying, right? So part of the design that, that we were going through is trying to address and, and make it as simple as possible, be as thoughtful as possible, but still maintain a level of respect. So, so obviously we wanted to, to stop that in some way. So, so we kind of started tying some of those into to our core values. Once we identified a need, then we said, okay, we're going to make a list of things that we're going to stick to no matter what, right? And so, like Nate was saying, that's going to inform our dev development because the design decisions are going to be based on these core values. Uh, so here's a quote. Uh, Nate mentioned Mark Bolton earlier. Uh, younger brother of M Michael, he said, wasn't it? <laughs> we'll go with it. Uh, <laughs> and he mentioned that these these three things were... Uh, they were they were really key um, to to creating that foundation, right? And so understanding, talking to, and and observing are all things that we wanted to not only capture, but they're things that we wanted to make sure were a part of our process. Uh, and so some of those some of those values that we identified um, first was this idea of it's going to be video, so there needs to be some way to force a time limit in some way. Um, mostly because we were hosting it on one IIS box under a desk in an office at the University of Minnesota. <coughs> and so, you know, there was a concern for storage starting out. But on top of that, out of some of these challenges brings a, an opportunity, right? And we realized something. If you put a time limit on something, people are going to have to think about what they're saying they're going to have to learn to be more succinct. If they're needing to take more time, you probably asked the question wrong, so that turns it back on the teacher. And on top of that, it allows for a, a different level of creativity from the person, the person responding. And, and to take that a step further, thanks, that's okay. Uh, other people aren't going to watch a long video when there's 30 other that they, they also need to watch on the same topic, right? So you want it to be in-depth enough that you get something from it, but then also uh, be able to consume multiple videos. So, so that was kind of that idea. Um, so that starts to, to understand that impact as, as the, the large videos. And then the, the other step on the last slide was that we wanted to deal with security. We were trying to design this in a way that people didn't have user accounts for students. The teacher does, but it's this way that anyone can come on and respond. And as I said earlier, we didn't want to deal with online bullying. And so how do you do that when there's anonymity? Did I say that right? Anonymity? An anonymity? Anonymity? Homonomina? <laughs> and on top of that, we wanted to deal with security. These are students, sometimes K-12 students. If you look for Flipgrid on Twitter, you're going to see a ton of incredible responses to amazing projects uh, from elementary students. And those are people. Those are data points. And they have futures, right? And so we need to protect that. Uh, one of the cool things is being at the University of Minnesota, we have uh, a lot of really cool things in place for student data already. So being able to to work at the university and store our stuff there was actually a huge benefit. Um, but in addition, the, the other value that we had was that we wanted to make sure, uh, as Charlie was traveling to other continents, that he was going to be in places with low bandwidth, like Best Buy headquarters or you know places like that. 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. Actually, it's really fast. I'm, I'm kidding. And so once we had our values, we wanted to start getting an idea down. So we used Paper 53 to kind of start sketching some, some ideas. And that kind of turned into an actual brand of, of Flipgrid. And Charlie likes to say that you don't have a product until it's on a t-shirt. So I, I, feel like, I feel like we've done something. That's awesome. Um, and so the, the principles that we then identified uh, around those core values are we needed to accomplish three things. We wanted people to be able to record or capture. We wanted people to be able to view those. And we wanted people to be able to share them. And when you think about that, that just makes complete sense, right? So erasing the idea of Flipgrid for a moment, how would I accomplish this? I would record myself in photo booth or whatever. Maybe export that if it's possible, upload it to YouTube, send a link to someone. Oh yeah, I would of course I'd add an effect, but and then send a link. That's that's a lot of steps. Ask a third grader to do that. Right? I mean that's that's crazy. And so we wanted a way to kind of keep that in one place, keep it incredibly simple, and keep it more of a, a shell or or a tool that teachers could kind of take and use it how they wanted to. So rather than put a lot of rules in place, we just wanted to keep the simple process and in a way that people can actually accomplish the goal of, of communicating. So then we started sketching out the interface and thinking about how that could actually work, how people could be next to each other and how you could kind of experience this, this sort of principles laid out into a, a design using a lot of, of what Nate was talking about Earlier, we wanted to, to make sure we stuck to our, our structure and, and start building that skeleton out. And then we take it in. We're, we're very heavy into jumping right into Photoshop and using that as a, a way to begin prototyping before prototyping. And uh, it's really good that we have some people wicked quick at, at Photoshop because that can be a, a huge undertaking. But as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to avoid student accounts. That's a crazy thing to try and accomplish. But again, we were talking about younger kids using this. Are they going to remember their Blackboard login, their Gmail login, all the different things, and then we're going to give them Flipgrid to? No. It needs to be simple. It needs to be something that people will use. We want people to use it. We want people to communicate. So how do you get rid of that but still honor the security, right? So that was one of the, the design challenges. So we created a way to add different levels of security. Um, and this is a, a modal on the, the teacher side. And it gives you the ability to set a password for it um, if you have a concern for the topic or um, it was open and then you had problems and, and something was reported, then, then you could set a password on it. You can moderate the, the videos. <coughs> Excuse me. You can moderate the videos so that you watch the video before turning it on for other people to see. Uh, you can hide social links so it can't be tweeted out, and you can hide the direct URL to specific videos so that people can't go right to a video and, and you can't just say, hey, check out what such and such said or that sort of a thing. Or you can leave it completely open and completely public and have it as an open forum. So this just kind of gave a bunch of different ways to add security around the content but still have people accessing it without a lot of obstacles or barriers. What we didn't expect was that it would grow outside of education. Boy Scouts troops have used it um, at weddings as like a video photo booth. Imagine people that didn't come to your wedding unless you're single or something. But in any case, <laughs> we've all been to a wedding and we've all either had a camera shoved in our face where we have to record something for the, the lucky couple or whatever that situation is. And this is a neat way for people not there to be able to experience the, the evening or day or whatever, but also share and contribute a message. Sorry, I couldn't be there and that sort of a thing. And it's real time right there online as it's happening. People could capture it, post it, and, and you could even have a large screen in the back. And so it was really cool to see people come with these creative ideas to use this tool that we just wanted to use uh, so Charlie could talk to some of his students while he was in other places around the world. 
And so there's only really one requirement when you work at Vidku. Uh, <laughs> but we are hiring. Is there any? Um, you kind of got a beard starting. You're hired. Um, <laughs> but yeah, how tall? You got to be between 5'6 and 5'9, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> No, in all seriousness, no, we are looking for um, front-end, back-end developers, um, mobile as well. Um, we're just looking for rock stars. We want people to be a part of a really cool process and solve really cool problems. So I know everyone probably says that, um, but not everybody's stand-up starts at 9.30, so we do have that going for us. But in any case, this is us. You can follow us. You can talk to us. I'd love to hear some questions. I'm sure you... Might have one or two, hopefully. Colin experienced that earlier. Colin's talk was awesome. Brian's going to be talking later. Brian, Maddie, if you guys are into closure and some really cool uh, functional programming, that's the place to go. Um, at 1.15? 1.15. Check them out. Any questions? 1.45. A nitty gritty question about uh, COPPA. Have you heard of the Chil Children's Online Privacy and Protection mm -hmm. Act? How does, I'm developing something similar with that and I've been involved with kids apps and that privacy thing. How does it, because capturing kids images is, you need parental. Uh, so we have this awkward step in the recording process. It's, it's the, the required must have a, at the beginning with a lot of legal jargon. But one of the cool things is being at the University of Minnesota um, and having the, the privacy pieces that we have in place for the, the data. The only thing that's really less left is parental permission and, and all of those pieces. Um, and so we do have the disclaimers that, that um, the, the students' parents need to sign off if they're under the, under the age of 12 and all of these sorts of things. Um, we can't really police that. That's kind of up to the teacher to understand that these are rules that they need to follow. And so if they're using this tool in their classroom, this is something that they're going to have to... Right, exactly. Exactly. Because we don't have user accounts, they have to agree at the recording step each time they record. So it's just uh, clicking this button, I agree, each time. But at the same time, that, that gives the, the opportunity for the putting that back on, on the instructor and the, the parents to police that. Exactly, yep. Yep. Have you partnered with other groups like uh, Schoology or other programs that uh, high schools and other, co other schools use? So a lot of those tools have APIs that you can hook in. LTI is a, a common buzzword around that. Um, one of the challenges we face is we don't have user accounts. And a lot of those connections into those tools are so that it can connect with a specific student's account. Um, instead, we are embeddable. Anywhere you can embed a YouTube video or that sort of a thing, you can just drop the uh, entire grid of videos in there and, and interact with it. Um, or just sh drop the link in there. You can even put that as part of a forum and still have a discussion. We're not against the idea of forums that we were kind of poking fun at earlier. They actually serve a fantastic purpose. Yeah, so to have a more, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's, it's more to basically extend the classroom another five or ten minutes. Kids are learning something that they otherwise wouldn't have. And one of the biggest pieces that I was stunned to hear and thrilled every time it comes up is that teachers multiple times a week email us saying, I didn't even know this student had a voice. To, to hear students actually take the time and record an answer to a question that otherwise they never raise their hand in class, it's, it's an incredible thing to see. I was wondering if local governments have started using this as a tool to get feedback from citizens. That's an interesting question and one that I believe this guy has been exploring a little bit. This is, this is Joey. Joey's on our team. And um, that's something that actually has recently come up and something we're more than happy to explore if people want to get in touch with us. Joey would be the guy to talk to for that. It's pretty cool. Um, I had a question about the, the experts panel. 
so she had uh, different people from all different locations respond to specific questions from students and it was a really cool way to sort of ask the expert without the expert having to do a lot of work. Yeah. That is cool. W Charlie and I presented at a conference in uh, Hawaii a year, about a year, year and a couple months ago. Um, and it was uh, ACOG, it was a gynecology conference. And uh, Charlie was the keynote, and uh, I kind of helped present with that. And it was incredible to be a part of a conference that usually we go to like education conferences. And, and so it was really cool to kind of get outside of our bailiwick a little bit and, and see how other people do it. But what, what was neat is they used Flipgrid all throughout the conference and to seed questions for the panel. They would ask questions in the audience, but if you wanted to pre-record a question, if it was somebody on the panel that you were really excited to hear from, you could actually post the questions into the Flipgrid, uh, the the question that they had, and then they would they had it pulled up on a screen. And when there wasn't a question in the audience, they would actually just play a pre-recorded question from somebody. And it was really cool to see uh, the audience be able to engage. And it's different than seeing like live twittering going on. You see that sometimes, and that can backfire and that sort of thing. This is just a cool way to actually engage the speakers in a different way because it's things that you want to hear about, and you're actually impacting the the discussion so yeah it's really cool to hear those stories no no i'm joking <laughs> how does your embedding a flipgrid work with mobile because i know some recording technologies are kind of weird <laughs> no we actually have uh um and i we released an ipad version first and that was more focused towards the classrooms um because we have a lot of ipad carts right um so we have an ipad app and then we also have um an iphone app um and um, probably our next step will be uh, looking at Android in, in different um, environments. Because well, you talked about the embed, and I imagine that works websites. So then when you click on like the embed, would it, if you had the mobile app, would it take you to the mobile? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and so that's a really cool part about it is that um, um, if any teacher anywhere sends out an email or, or posts it to a form, right, you just you just touch the link and then we auto direct you to that grid. You're not searching around for it. So we've we've provided those before and stuff. Do you think like uh, transcribing or speech to text for either search or for people that might be hearing impaired? Yeah, that's a great question. We've um, we've we've experimented with that. Uh, the hard issue, and this is when we got into the mobile realm, right? Is uh, we really want people to go out and like record and and walk around and 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 do some really cool things with that, but the microphone, if you're outside, sometimes you get a gust of wind, and, and it, it does deteriorate the quality. But um, that's something we're definitely looking at incorporating. Because then, then you have searchable, right? Like, you can then go through and say if it's a public grid, then you can search for whatever you want, and, and we can go through that. Sweet. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you all for showing up.